Good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Kat Patillo, and we've been sitting for a pretty long time. So the first thing I'm going to have us do, if everyone can just stand up, stand up, and I'd like you to just stretch your hands up in the air as high as you can, swing them to the left, swing them to the right, shake them around a bit, shake your right foot in the air, shake your left foot in the air, do a couple spins around. Hopefully that's woken us up a bit. So you can sit back down. The first thing we're gonna do, so we've been focused so far today on who's building the future of learning in India. And my session is gonna focus on who is building the future of learning in African countries. And we'll talk more in a bit about why that's relevant to us today. The first thing we're gonna do is do a quick game. Okay. So, I'm gonna read out a list of statements, and if the statement applies to you, I'd like you to stand up, clap your hands once, stay standing until I ask you to sit down. So let's practice. I am excited to be attending the Future of Learning Unconference today. Oh, we only have some people excited, it seems. So remember, if the statement applies to you, you stand up and clap once. So let's try this again. Sit back down. I am excited to be attending the Future of Learning Unconference today. And sit back down. Great. I am a teacher, or I was a teacher in the past. And sit. I am a student. Oh, I love how a lot of adults stood up for that one. That's great. I am a principal of a school or head of a school chain and sit. I am a CEO or leader of an education company that is not a school. I work with an investor or a foundation that supports the education space. I have traveled to an African country, and this includes North Africa, Egypt, Morocco. I have traveled to South Africa. Now stay standing. So for those who are standing, I'd like one of you to share, what is one thing you noticed about South Africa's education system or schools? One thing you noticed when you were in South Africa. Any of you willing to share? Just one thing. It can be small. Smita, what's one thing you noticed? Can we get a mic over here, please? So I worked in a community bank in South Africa, and the one thing I noticed was over a time frame, which is you know before apartheid and after, the people who came before uh, apartheid, uh, the non-whites, uh, one whole generation had been left behind, and still their children were struggling uh, in the schooling system. Hmm. Thank you. You guys can sit. I've traveled to Egypt. Anybody in the room traveled to Egypt? What's one thing you noticed about Egypt's education system or schools? Can we have you guys stand back up? Can one of you guys, are one of you willing to share something you noticed? Nothing you noticed, okay. I've traveled to Nigeria. Anyone in here been to Nigeria? Two people. What's one thing you noticed about Nigeria's education system? The mic, please. Lots of small schools, and uh, I have seen children very excited to go to school. Well-dressed, clean uniforms, and all, yeah. So. 
Thank you. I've traveled to Kenya. Traveled to Kenya. One thing you noticed about Kenya's education system? You willing to share? There's something called a red book or something which the government uses to control what books or what education interventions goes into a school, which is mm -hmm. quite limiting from an ecosystem point of view. Thank you. My school or organization is interested in expanding our work to African markets. No one, okay. I'm interested in learning from schools and organizations that are building the future of learning in African countries. Great. Um, I think that the slides are messed up. Can you just maybe download a PDF and pull that up? Because this isn't what I sent, thank you. So we've heard from a few different people so far from their observations about how different African countries have different contexts. So just as different states in India have different contexts, African countries have many different contexts as well. And I want to start by talking about why are we actually talking about this. Um, the slide that just came up that they'll pull up in a moment shows population growth. And in 2050, if we look at the top 20 countries in the world, seven of those countries are African. So seven out of the top 20 countries in the world will be African. So we're going to see this huge population growth in African countries. And with that population growth is going to become many kids and many youth. OK, I guess we'll just have to go with this, even though. So the slide's a little bit, the formatting was messed up. But you can see here the seven countries in green are the African countries that are going to have the highest population growth. And it's going to be critical for us to transform these schools. Just as India's population rises um, and we need to transform schools here, we need to do so in these countries as well. And here's a map of the African continent. And what we're going to focus on today is what are a couple of the bright spots? This is a map that shows population density growth. And if you look here, these are some of the bright spots where a lot of education innovation is happening. So if you look over here in Nigeria, you see a hot spot for population and it's a hot spot for education reform as well. East Africa, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, and then South Africa. So there are four main trends in the future of learning in Africa. And I want to explain those to you guys and share a couple of examples of who's doing exciting work in each area. So the first one, which many of you are familiar with, is just this idea of tech-enabled learning and blended learning. And there's three organizations doing really great work in this area. Moringa School in Kenya does vocational training with tech skills and places students in jobs using a blended model. They have about a 95% job placement rate. They're growing really fast. Spark Schools in South Africa is a really great chain of schools to know about. Uh, it's a primary school chain where the kids spend about a third of their day doing educational games and software. And they've grown rapidly across South Africa. And the third is Chalkboard Education in Ghana, which is doing mobile learning through phones. And Ghana, as well as many other African nations, have very high mobile penetration, often more in dumb phones, not smartphones yet. Um, although there are some, but they're not quite as prevalent. There's many other examples of these, but three, these are three of the main ones. The second is schools that are building curriculums for leadership and entrepreneurship. And one example is African Leadership Academy in South Africa. So this is where I worked for four years in Johannesburg. And it's a model that's identifying future leaders from across Africa for an intensive leadership development program. One exciting part of the curriculum was in the second year, all students ran a business. And they were part of a team that spent the entire year working on a real business, uh, which gave them an experiential um, opportunity to learn all kinds of real entrepreneurship and leadership skills. A second one is a Barso School of Science and Tech in Somaliland. So this is essentially a leadership academy uh, that brings together students from across Somaliland um, to do STEM skills. 
Gashora Girls Academy in Rwanda is another example, kind of similar to Abarso, but just for women. And they're very focused on building the pipeline of women in STEM across Rwanda. And the fourth is the Shafko Kibera School for Girls. So this is a model that's a nonprofit that has leadership academies in slums, specifically for girls, that are focused on um, developing them to then become change makers in their communities. The third trend is different models for improving schools for coaching, through coaching, and communities of practice for teachers and principals. So Accelerate Ed is doing amazing work on this in Ethiopia. They're in many schools. They're about to expand to Kenya. Dignitas is a model um, specifically for low-fee private schools that's um, supporting schools in Kenya to improve. Tusome is a really interesting example where they're using um, getting the government um, teacher trainers to actually use tablets when they do observations of teachers to give feedback on a massive scale. And Kidogo supports low-fee private schools, specifically preschools and slums, to improve their quality through coaching. The final trend is partnerships with governments. And these are definitely fewer and far between than the first three but there's still some exciting work going on. So one is in South Africa around ECD. There's some exciting work of um, different actors trying to influence ECD policy, so that's preschool level education. Um, in Kenya, which is where I'm based, in Nairobi, the government is in the midst of a really historic process of reforming the entire national curriculum to focus on 21st century skills. It's a big topic of conversation. You'll see this is the front page of, the of one of the main newspapers um, in January of last year. Also in Kenya and a couple of other East African countries is Educate, which supports high school students to learn entrepreneurship skills. And they partnered to get that model into the national curriculum at a huge scale. Finally, in Ghana, Lively Minds is doing some great work around ECD and supporting government preschools to have higher quality. So what I'd like you guys to do now, I've given you a little bit of examples, context of some of what's happening across the African continent in the future of learning, but I wanna talk about your questions in our final couple of minutes. So if everyone can just take out a pen or if you have a cell phone handy, you're also welcome to make a note on your cell phone and hold it in the air. So hold your pen or your cell phone, whatever you're gonna to use to write on, hold it in the air. I see a couple people with their hands raised. Looks like the people in the front are doing well, still waiting on some people. So you should either have a pencil or a phone in your hand in the air. What I'd like you to do with that is think of a question. What's something that you are curious about related to education innovation in African markets? It can be about innovative schools, ed tech, policy, specific African countries, and write that question down on your piece of paper or write it in your phone. So take a minute silently to do that. Okay, let's get those hands a little higher so we can see who's, who's here in the room. So for those who have questions and have your hands raised, who wants to pose them? Let's take three questions first and then I'll try to speak to them before we wrap up. So the first one in the very back with your hand, the sweatshirt, what's your question? Can we get him a mic? Thank you. Which is more important, the, what the student wants to learn or the, what the teacher wants to teach. Hmm. What's more important, what a student wants to learn or what a teacher wants to teach? Fascinating question. So I'll take that one first and then we can move on to the others. I think that's a great question for us all to think about and I definitely don't have an answer for that one. But I think we probably all have opinions. I mean, my opinion on that would be probably that what the student wants to learn is more important and that the teacher is there to support the student's learning. Um, but I do think that sometimes, as a teacher myself, I taught for four years, 
um, sometimes the students don't quite know yet what they need to learn. So as a teacher, you sometimes need to help them understand what they actually don't know yet and help guide them there. Who else has a question you want to pose? Yes, in the back left. So I'm trying to just figure out in terms of numbers, uh, in access to education, how m in those huge numbers in terms of population, how many percent of those children of a school going age are actually going to school, not going to school, was one question. But connected to that is that from all of those educational uh, initiatives that you spoke of, um, are there many more? Uh, how, how do, how, are they enough to sort of address the scale of what needs to be addressed in, in Africa? So it's both with right. the population and then the impact of the initiatives because I'm trying to analogize it to here where I see uh, a lot of siloed activity, lots of different people trying to pull, to a, pull towards the same problem but all doing it independently of each other and mm. I'm just trying to figure out how that relationship works over there in Africa. I think the way you framed it just now is actually very similar to what I've seen happening in many African countries. Can we pull up this slideshow, please? Um, I think there is a, a lot of siloed work happening and very little of it is actually scaled and reaching many students. So there's a lot of hype in the space. You know, we can point to lots of exciting examples but very few of them are actually reaching millions of students. And I just want to go back to this population slide. Um, you know, even Nigeria alone, 411 million people, it's going to be a huge school-going population, and I think any of the innovative schools or ed tech models there are still only reaching very few. So there's a huge opportunity for new models to come in, also for these models to scale, and I think that's where for any entrepreneurs in the room who are thinking about growth, I know India is a huge market on its own, but there's a lot of potential in somewhere like Nigeria, DRC, Ethiopia, um, where there's many fewer innovative education interventions happening. Um, and I think even of the ones that I highlight here, you know, Spark Schools, I want to say has under 20 schools right now. I mean, they have huge plans for growth, but they don't have that many yet. Moringa has only one site right now, but they're growing. Um, so many of these really have not scaled. Bridge Academies would be um, probably one of the few examples that has really achieved bigger scale um, in Kenya. And they're also in Nigeria. Um, let's take one final question from the kid who just raised his hand in the white shirt, and then we'll wrap, and then I'll be done. Uh, I, have a two I have two questions. One of them is, do you, do you actually learn if, you, if, you do, if you're not interested in going to school? Do you actually learn anything? Good question. Do you actually learn if you're not interested in going to school? Hmm. Also another question, I think there's no right answer. But my opinion would be you probably don't learn that much if you're not interested in what you're learning because you'll be disengaged. But I think that's a great question for you to think about, for us all to think about. I've touched on some of the trends of what's happening, some examples. We've discussed a couple of your questions. Um, but I'd love to keep the conversation going. If any of you have questions about um, education sectors in African countries, African markets, um, the future of learning, any of these people I spotlighted, I'd be happy to connect you with them to learn from them. So here's my email if you want to write it down. Um, and then also if you're interested specifically in Kenya's education, future of learning in Kenya's context, um, there's an article uh, with this link that you can read that'll tell you more about it. So thank you so much. I request Ms. Caitlin to please stay back on stage. I request Mr. Uh, Chandrasekharan to please come up on stage. 